started, especially since I'm very happy to announce we do have giveaways. Uh, JetBrains came through with six licenses for ID, an IDE of your choice. So, um, but you must be present to win. So hopefully this doesn't take a long time and everyone's back in the room and not at the airport, but um, here we go. Um, let's see if we can get a winner here. Oops, let me just, God, I hate windows. Yeah. <laughs> okay. What am I doing wrong here? I should just be able to type in that field. Can I just? Oh no, what happened to the magical equation that I made? How did that get? Undo. Oh, okay, oh, we're, we back. we're back. Okay, <clears throat> so sorry, I del somehow deleted his magical equation. How bad of me. So is Anne-Marie Mesco here? Back there in the back, yay! Please, please come up. Eric has your license key. You get that? Copy, I'm gonna paste this over here. Oops, undo. Paste values only. Okay, Lisa Conrad, is she here? She's not here? Okay. Blake Galbraith? Is Blake here? Nope, okay. Let's try this again. God, I hate windows. Or my lack of mouse skills on a PC. Yeah, come on. <laughs> I got the emojis up. That's good. Progress, right? Christopher Novak? Christopher here? Nope. Let's hope this doesn't take forever. Um, Especially my mouse skills here. May Chan. May's here. Yay, come get your license. Or is she not here? Right there. Please come up and get your license key. Birkin. Is Birkin still here? You are? Yay. Old timer there, getting his due here. Not necessarily old, but old timer. Just want to make that clear. Oh, I want to copy this. Christopher Weimer. Is Christopher here? Christopher? Yeah, you are. Good. Matthew Calzada, is Matthew here? Nope. Arcadia Falcone, Arcadia, yay. Mary, Mary Jing Jingaluski. Hey! Awesome volunteer, got something, yay. Oops, don't do that. Anywhere else? Uh. 
We need someone with better mouse skills than me on here. Oh, God, did I destroy your formula again? Oh, last one. Duh. I, I only counted five. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Winners. Yay. Next time we need someone who actually knows what he's doing up here. Um, lighting talk, Sean Ellis, I believe you're first up. Sean, can you come up? There you are. I assume you know where your talk is. How do I do presenter mode? Right here. Is that it? Just, there we yeah. go. Got it. Okay. okay. Okay, this is going to be a very quick talk on Mirador 3, just a status update. About four weeks ago, um, a bunch of people gathered in Stanford and uh, started uh, kickoff zero, uh, sprint zero of Mirador 3 development. What is Mirador? If anyone hasn't seen Mirador yet, it's a IIIF viewer, um, comparison, annotation, deep zoom, uh, things like that. And it's essentially a maintainable, sustainable, extensible, community-supported open source viewer for media content, said a very hopeful person one day, or essentially flexibility without forking. Um, we essentially needed to rewrite the entire thing, and that is um, very good news for everybody out there because it means you can have a lot of influence in the direction that it goes, um, and it's going to be a lot better developer experience. We've done a lot of wireframing. Jennifer Vine and, and Gary Geisler out at Stanford have been doing lots of prototypes. We have a huge team, biggest team I've ever worked on, distributed around the world. Um, people in uh, Leipzig, Germany, Munich, uh, Stanford. I'm at Princeton, and um, when will it be ready? Never. Um, because you continue the development with the beautiful plugin architecture and uh, you make it your own. Um, but phase one ends in late March around LDCX, um, and this is what we want to complete by then. Embeddable Mirador in catalog record view, something very basic. Um, use Mirador standalone in your Rails, Act, Rails app or React app or even in CodePen IO or JS Fiddle. And we want a really good developer experience, as I mentioned, for theming and plugins. We want you to make Mirador your own. Um, so the big reveal, after four weeks, we actually almost have a Mirador-like thing without the annotations. Um, and you can see Bob Ross over here. We can do some deep zooming there. How can you get involved? Well, Mirador community calls every other Thursday. Really, really important. You can help direct this, um, and uh, we're hoping you will get on there. Um, continuous integration means that you can actually play with the, um, the current version up here. I'll, you'll, you'll be able to see these slides oh, open in Google Chrome. Well, you'll be able to do that on your own. So anyway, thanks. Um, and this is, uh, you know, I have to say I wanted to get through this because I have so a little bit of a tie in here with Bob Ross, uh, a little bit of a library DRM and um, open access story, uh, while we were on the plane, the only content we could actually view because of the DRM was Bob Ross. And if you have listened to Bob Ross recently, you know he's like the original ASMR um, uh, person, you know, like really low voice, super soothing, like that, that round brush is just like, <laughs> you know. So we got really inspired and we made uh, some music. And it's called Happy Little Trees. And if I can find where it is, I'm going to play it for you. Because um, I was at karaoke last night. And I just don't want the music to end. So um, this is a dissertation that I found on motion graphics on archive.org, inspired by Bob Ross. And what was so amazing about this is that um, you can kind of see, this is like Bob Ross of the future, you know, making like happy little trees on his computer. And um, yeah, it's, uh, Mirador eventually will look like this as well. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's, uh, it was a really beautiful thing to be able to use open access materials and 
make make something fun. Wow, that was awesome. some kind of awesome for sure. Bob Ross, ASMR, audio and dancing, Jesus. Um, Carly, you're up. So um, after a question that arose at the end of, oh dear, maybe it is gone. Um, my talk, I decided I would do a quick intro to what audio description actually is, which hopefully will get people thinking about how they can include it in videos that they create for their library or um, whether it makes sense to be included in all of them. All right. So. <clears throat> Just a really quick intro to what audio description is, starting off with an actual example. Um, this is a video that's just meant to be an introduction to universal design, but it's not really important what the content is. I just want everyone to have a chance to listen to how audio description is done. Leave anomalous, adventures in universal design. Exterior of a house on a sunny day, the normals are outside. Meet Harry Normal. Harry is the father of the family. He is a stay-at-home dad. Okay, so the two different voices you heard there, the first one was doing the audio description. They were talking about what the... Um, Set, setting the scene for someone who wasn't able to see the video, and they chose what content to highlight based on what was the context that people would need and what was going to be then later covered by the spoken portion of the existing video track. Because these exist as two separate tracks, typically. Audio description track would be a separate track from the actual audio that everyone would hear anytime they saw this video. And unfortunately, YouTube doesn't really allow you to have these as two separate tracks, but but um, in many different systems, that's how it would be played. Usually the solution in YouTube is to instead um, have two different versions of the video, which of course isn't as good for necessarily someone being able to find it and knowing that there is a version available with audio description, but it's kind of the necessary workaround still. Um, but audio description is way more than that, and you may not realize it, but it really is out there everywhere. Um, your local movie theater probably offers videos um, it, with audio description, uh, much as there are ways to find sort of the secret catalog of genres. In Netflix, there's also a way that you can go just by URL directly to only content that's available with audio description. And a lot of their own original content um, is available that way, as well as some of the other content that they have online. Um, and in fact, if you have heard of audio description before, you've probably heard of it because there was a um, kind of well-known article about the fact that um, the best performance in this one original movie on Netflix was actually the person doing the audio description. Um, and this was kind of meant uh, tongue-in-cheek and snarkily, but in fact, that's actually a really bad sign. Good audio description generally should fade into the background and is merely meant to be contextual. So what are the best practices for creating it? Um, you want to focus on content that's meaningful to understanding the visual content and context. So contextual information that someone might not be able to perceive if they can't um, visually see the video. So the who, the where, that sort of information. 
Um, unexplained sounds will often be explained in the audio track. Um, and any important gestures, motions, facial expressions, other things where it would be hard from purely the audio to tell what's going on. You don't want to describe everything. Um, and that's sort of where it becomes a judgment call and why people often say that it requires a lot of training to do it very well, particularly for films, because often there's a lot of things there that aren't important. Is it important what sweater color I'm wearing right now? Probably not. Um, those are the sorts of things that you have to know whether to decide to leave them in or out. Um, and the reason why that's so important is because generally you're trying to fit the description into natural pauses in the audio track and you're trying to be as unobtrusive as possible. Um, now there are more extended versions of audio descriptions where you will actually stop the audio track, pause the film to allow more time, but generally speaking, particularly for most of the videos that people here would probably be creating, you are trying to fit it into the natural pauses that fit within the existing audio track. Um, and as I mentioned already, you need to consider whether you want this to be an additional track or whether you want there to be two copies of the video. Um, and there are advantages to both depending on where you're hosting. Um, so recommended tools. I talked about Cadet um, before, but I wanted to mention it again specifically. It's a free tool. Um, if you don't feel that you have the ability to create these, whether it's time or um, knowledge, um, I would also recommend the American Council of the Blind's audio description project. They ha keep a whole list of providers who can um, create these for institutions. And um, topics I think it's worth considering going forward. Um, does audio description really make the content usable for users? So for example, um, are you creating an experience that then is meaningful to them by offering audio description? Or are you providing audio description, for example, for a tutorial for how to use a database that actually is itself inaccessible to use in such a way that they may not be able to use that database? And also I think we need to start thinking at this point about what does accessibility mean for other types of multimedia? Um, what does it mean for 3D content that we're creating? What does it mean for data visualization? Some people are doing some really interesting work in this area, but when we're thinking in libraries about data visualizations, are we considering how, what that means for accessibility? And as a lot of people have been talking about AR and VR here, what does accessibility mean for those as well? And I'm not saying that that means audio descriptions for all these, I'm merely saying that I think these are the next things that we should be considering what the comparable making it accessible is that we should be thinking about. Um, I will share these on the system. I've included some additional resources as well. The ITC guidance is some of the most detailed on what audio description should be, and um, that might be something that people will be interested in as well, and I'll also put this up on Twitter. Thank you. Jason, you're up. <clears throat> Isn't it amazing what you can learn in five minutes? My mind is blown, you know, with all the stuff I saw, just saw. It's great. I do. I do. Yeah, thanks. Hmm. There we go. Okay. Morning, Code for Lib. It's awesome to be here. We made it. It's Friday. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about an idea that I've uh, been kicking around for about a year and a half or so. Um, and I want us to think uh, inspiration for our projects can come from just about anywhere. And so that's one of, our, one of the takeaways I want you to, to, to think about here. Um, and then I, I want us to think about more how does metadata or how can metadata work differently for our digital library apps, the, the software that we build. Um, that's me. Uh, this inspiration uh, that I'm going to speak to right now is um, comes from one of my favorite albums. So uh, 1993, I bought this album. Uh, it's a Tribe Called Quest, Midnight Marauders. and. Uh, it had jazz samples and social consciousness and wordplay, and my head just. Um, so I was inspired. I'm inspired by this. I listen to this album probably too often, even even today. And on one of my multi, you know, one of these listens, it occurred to me that there's. And I'm not going to play this because I'm just not brave. Uh, I don't think it will play, so I didn't embed it right. Um, over the course of this album, there's a narrator, a woman narrator, who talks about 
It could be very uh, occasionally social conscious annotations, what you can do, how you should listen to the album, why you should be listening to the album. And it occurred to me that this is actually a form of embedded metadata. Um, there's also a culture of attribution within the album itself. And uh, hip hop has parts of this. Uh, it's not just, um, and, and, and one of the things that's interesting to me is this is embedded. This is, is, this is an attribution that travels with the track or the object itself. Um, so they're in line even at the album level. And if you start to pull apart this within the hip hop uh, corpus, if I guess this is what we want to call it that, um, even a, a public enemy and it takes nations to uh, takes a nation to pull us to millions to hold us back. Um, there are there are a number of ways that they introduce their DJ or who that who's who's going to sing on this this track or who's going to speak. Um, and this embedded metadata it just got me thinking more, bigger about not only embedded metadata but the way that we're starting to move into an area where uh, the metadata we put on things is behavioral. Um, and I think you'll see this in some of Tammy Allgood Wolf's talk about voice search. Um, we're t not only describing things, we're also kind of describing actions and things you can do with uh, the objects themselves. Um, and so this embedded behavioral metadata that resides in the, the, the object itself got me thinking. And there's precedents for, for stuff like this. There's Adobe's um, extensible metadata packet and EXIF for media, um, but you don't even have to go that far. Uh, this, who's seen this in a book? Uh, cataloging in publication, right? So there's, there are ways that this, this metadata can be embedded within the object. Um, and I think we have, there are new affordances in the web that in, in favor uh, this embedded metadata. And so I started to do some research around a digital library application and how you could take some of these standards and move them into that digital collection. Um, so some of you are familiar, we haven't seen a lot of talks about it. There's a web scale vocabulary called schema.org that allows you to describe various parts of your site, um, the entities within your site. Um, there's a newer standard that's part of a progressive web app standard um, called the manifest JSON. That's a manifest file that can describe a, a, a site at the top level. And then there's uh, newer kinds of ways of describing um, item level nanopubs. Um, so you can think through kind of a prescribed architecture for discovery. Um, this, this is the way you describe your site itself with schema. Um, you have that manifest file that I mentioned, which actually um, allows you to uh, define what, an app, what, a, what a website is about, um, what it could be about, what it's related to. Um, and then you have this newer standard called activity streams, which allows you to break apart. So if you think about the item level of our metadata, um, it allows you to break apart and actually d talk about notes or methods or summaries that are part of that, um, in this case, an article. And so I started to experiment with a, a couple of these, just this, these markup practices, and I wanted us, I haven't gone all, you know, all the way, but that's the point of uh, lightning talks. So um, I'm just kind of continuing to, to look through how this might work in a broad, uh, large-scale setting. Uh, so I'm going to continue testing with some how the web, web crawlers and web archiving tools treat this data. Um, continue to refine that activity stream metadata, and these are all um, W3C standards, um, and then test the utility of that really advanced metadata on, at the item level as different kinds of browse points or search points. Um, and it's inspiring. Um, again, I'm gonna f reach back. Uh, this, this idea of flow, it's the way a, a hip hop artist constructs words on a beat. Um, and this, what I see uh, is this, this method, the, uh, the way the web is growing and the way we can embed this behavioral metadata, um, we're working with the flow of the web, right? So there's just a ton of opportunity here. And there's a beat to the web. Like if we follow the way uh, web standards work and how they're introduced and how they get implemented, um, we can start to work within this beat. And the, the question I have for us is how do we build metadata flow that works with that part, that, that trend within the web. 
Um, just thank my, my um, colleagues at Montana State University. And um, I have a small uh, GitHub repo that has a couple examples, uh, but I'm just getting started. So take a look and um, I'm gonna continue this research. If you have any interest, feel free to reach out. I tweeted into the, um, into the, in, in, to the hashtag, so um, that's all I got for right now. This is me. Thanks. Thanks, Jason. Mm -hmm. Dan Liu, you're up. So this kind of echoes back to the second lightning talking about the accessibility of VR and AR, basically AR, sorry. So um, what is the biggest pain point for AR? I think we all know it's the time when you ask the customer to install yet another app on their own personal mobile device. So I discovered this great tool I want to share with you if you haven't already known it. It's completely web-based. Um, unlike other um, AR tools, this one allows you to just create AR experience with a few lines of HTML code. And the one you see on the screen, um, it's something I come up last night when my little one went to bed, after my little one went to bed. And um, how it works, so on your mobile phone, or you know anything has a camera or a Chrome browser, open a URL, um, basically opens the web page I, I created the um, AR experience and then you point the your phone to uh, the marker uh, this marker is containing the code for lib 2019 logo and then you will see 3d objects pops up on your mobile phone or your device um, now here what it shows up is code for lib and for fun I replaced the I with the r2d2 um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this, um, I, I first dis discovered this too uh, last year when uh, my library, uh, Palo Alto City Library, was um, preparing to host a regional um, conference, and we want to have something really cool. Uh, so, so you know, attendees when they scan the, their badge, for example, they will see some um, uh, 3D objects. But it should be very simple. It doesn't. It shouldn't require them to install any extra piece of code. Um, now, if you are interested, I have some. Um, examples up on my GitHub repository, and you can also look at the source code to see how it works. At the back end, it basically used two technologies. One is called AR.js. Uh, it is a pure web solution for AR content. And then, then the other one is A-Frame. It's a web, wonderful web framework for VR. So you can also create VR um, experience with A-Frame that, that is supported by various goggles. Um, um, and um, the, the nice thing I've already talked about, it supported almost any modern mobile device, and you can also try it on your computer or uh, tablet. And that's basically my lightning talking. Thank you. Thomas, you're up to talk about local chapters. I'm waiting for the augmented reality where you point your phone at something and you get served a glass of wine, but I'm still waiting. <laughs> hey, hi, uh, my name is Thomas. Um, this came about at a breakout session uh, yesterday. I, during the session, at some point, we were like, oh, wouldn't that make a good uh, topic for a lightning talk? And I said that, and the moment I said it, I regretted it because it meant I had to do it. So <laughs> here I am. Uh, so this is, this is us. I'm going to try describing this, this, uh, my slides. So this is a s section of the world map with the approximate location of uh, San Jose. And uh, this is us in about 48 hours, or an approximation thereof. Um, and this is a map, the same map with like dots all over. Um, and uh, so this means, yeah, we're gonna go home and, and uh, back to our uh, regularly scheduled life. 
Um, thanks to modern technology, the website, the listserv, the journal, etc. of course, there, will, there are many ways to continue the conversations that uh, we started here or that we touched on here. Uh, but sometimes we need to talk to tackle meat data in meat space, if you get what I mean. Um, so how do you do that? Uh, well, thankfully, there are local and regional Code for Lib chapters, um, and this is a map where I tried to put uh, all of them on the map. Um, and unlike the previous slide, this one is actually based on actual data, uh, or almost. Um, and when did I get the data? I got it from the wiki, where, and this is a screenshot of the wiki, uh, where you can see on the front page, it's a list of local um, groups. And that's the main reason I'm doing this, because at the, that breakout session, we realized that not everyone is, was necessarily aware that these existed, or where to find information. So consider yourself aware now. Um, and because I am a librarian, I like lists, I like researching things. I like also to uh, multiple ways to visualize data, so I put it into a table. And I also looked at what was the, the time of the last recorded activity. And you can see that some groups are pretty active. They already know when their next meetings are. Uh, others are maybe a bit more dormant or uh, worse. Um, so um, where am I going with that is if you're like me, you're at that interesting moment at the end of a conference where on one end, I'm very happy that I get to crawl back into my hole and be alone for a while, but at the same time, kind of sad that this is ending. And, and uh, so one way to maybe continue this and or deal with it is a bit of an old choose your own adventure. So if you want to continue meeting with people, if there's a local group in your region, uh, then go to page five and say hi and join them. If there is one with its dormant, go, go to page 25, revive it. Uh, maybe suggest a topic or location, uh, a date. If there isn't one, go to page 110 and create one. And if you'd like to chat about ways to create or animate a local group, feel free to get in touch with me. And this is also a plug for our own group in Toronto, Ontario. That's it. Zach Pell, you're up now. Bob Ross is kind of a tough act to follow. Oh, we're good. All right, so um, my, I'm going to give a talk on creating a staff time off calendar for cheap. Um, and it's an intro to automation. The real title should be um, my excuse to stand on stage in Silicon Valley in a t-shirt. Um, <laughs> mission accomplished. All right, so our library was having an issue where um, our, how we're tracking time off, we're tracking it through LibCal, but all the dates were edited, edited in manually from our secretary. Um, employees would email the uh, secretary and she would add it to the calendar. This was obviously a very tedious task, took 30, 40 minutes a day, and my colleague and I thought we can automate that. So um, we used something called Zapier. Uh, it's an automation service. If you've ever heard of If This Then That, it's a similar premise. Um, it connects with over a thousand different apps, including, in our case, uh, Google Forms, Sheets, and Calendar. Um, let's see. Um, and also, it's a good idea. It, it's a side benefit of this is that it lets you get a good idea about how um, APIs work without any coding involved, um, because it, basically it handles all the backend uh, connecting to APIs without um, knowledge of JavaScript or Python or any other type of code. So the first thing we did is create the uh, form, the Google Forms. It's uh, standard time off, um, name, email, request type, uh, time, date, that sort of thing. Um, the form generates a spreadsheet um, with the responses. Um, and uh, oh, uh, about that no coding thing I said earlier, I lied. Um, but I will say, um, not all uh, coding, not all um, automation projects like this one would require coding. It's just that this particular instance, um, 
necessitated it. But obviously, it could be done without, there's plenty of different applications for uh, Zapier or IT, IFTTT without um, using code like I had to. Um, I had to modify the spreadsheet to contain a, um, uh, to create a unique event whenever a new um, row was populated, giving each request off event a uh, unique ID. Um, it assigned a color just so, so it looked pretty in the calendar, no real necessity for that but um, assigned a color number depending on the type of request. And um, I also made it correct for the common mistake of forgetting to hit PM on the um, this end time, which was a very frequent problem. And then I also have a script for an hourly that um, updates deleted events on the calendar, which Zapier did not handle. Uh, and now when you create a Zap in Zapier, um, a, a Zap is basically a workflow. Um, so, I'm not going to go through the whole procedure because it would take an hour, but I'm just going to give you the cliff notes here. Um, so you, it's triggered. It checks the what Zapier does is check uh, the Google Sheet every 15 minutes um, for a new or an updated row. Um, if it finds a row, it creates a new event in the Google Calendar uh, with the name, the uh, event ID, and um, the type of request. Um, and also takes a description. If a, an event is found when it queries the calendar, um, it updates with the updated information pulled from the spreadsheet. And as you can see, uh, the finished product, um, what the calendar looks like in the month view, um, this is actually live, this is next month. Um, and this is what it looks like in schedule view. And uh, it's not without its problems. Um, our current pricing tier, the $20 a month basic starter um, package, gives you 1,000 a tests per month. And um, we're currently using about 70% of that, um, so, but we're a pretty small organization. Um, it's difficult to, difficult to correct for invalid data entry. I'm, maybe someone who's more creative with coding could figure that out. Um, any edits um, to the sheet? Uh, trigger Zapier to update all the rows, which could cause problems using all of your um, uh, 1,000 tasks in one go. Um, and also the colors don't translate to a public calendar unless you share the calendar to that person. Um, depending on how comfortable, comfortable you are with, uh, Zapier, uh, with JavaScript, you can remediate a lot of these problems. I don't feel like devoting that much time to it. It works for us for the most part. And, uh, nope, 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 yeah, that's. Kiki and Darwin. Um, and any questions, you can at me. If someone signed up for speed mentoring, so you're up now. Good morning. Um, I don't have a slide, so uh, if you can, have uh, just go to the Slack channel, uh, Skillshare. Um, most of the stuff, uh, you will find some notes there. Um, this, I'm speaking for everyone that participated in the last two breakout sessions, uh, mentoring and speech share or speed mentoring. Um, so first, I want to thank and say thank you to the anonymous person who put this topic on the um, breakout session. We still don't know who did that, but a bunch of us uh, showed up um, and uh, we had a lively discussion. Um, we noticed there's a history of uh, mentoring program and Skillshare Club. Uh, we want to revive that. Um, and thanks to the uh, a few people in the dis first discussion, someone created the Slack channel, someone takes the notes, and uh, we came up, uh, we had a lively discussion about speeding da speed dating, speed mentoring, how to balance uh, between the formal mentoring program and informal uh, Skillshare or le learning buddy. Uh, so se second day, uh, we had uh, uh, ventured to the speed mentoring, uh, so a bunch of us sit together and talk uh, a few minutes with each other to say what do we want to learn, what do we want to share. Uh, some of the, there's some um, topics that are, I think are quite, um, um, has broader relevance, like 
how to deal with mark records, have find information and extract information from that, and Python, um, and, uh, and how to even someone with uh, many years of the coding, like website coding, what's the best practice? So these are the topics uh, we have to discussed. Um, so we come up with a Google sign-up sheet. We don't want to this end here. We want to continue that uh, no matter whether you want a formal uh, mentoring relationship or you just want to some um, informal uh, email chat or ask questions and uh, I'll just, uh, uh, let's say, I have a presentation slide. Please help me take a look. Um, so uh, no matter what style or like, uh, you can sign up uh, on the Google, uh, Google sign-up sheet that's also available in the Slack channel. Um, and we hope uh, next year during the um, Code for Lib, uh, we will have a recognition for those people who accomplish their goal. Um, so again, I uh, thank for everyone involved. Uh, some of them, I still don't know the name. Even I can see the face, I don't know the, I don't, I didn't get the name. And it's kind of hard to find people in the Slack channel because of all the uh, pseudonyms or uh, other types of names. Uh, so we also plan to update the wiki, so um, please uh, uh, keep an eye on that space. Um, so that's all. So again, join the community and we all learn together. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, we're straight into 20 minute talk. So Kate, uh, you're up first. All right, so everyone, as you can imagine, I'm talking about accessibility. So I'll admit I actually had a little bit of rethinking on this talk. Uh, it ends up being kind of about the same, but we've had a lot of good conversations here. But you know, it's one of those, I'm glad a lot of you have been really interested in accessibility, and I'm hoping you can learn something from here. So these are the websites librarians love, but are they accessible? DuckDuckGo, Google Scholar, SpringShare LibGuides, because I know some of you might absolutely hate these sites, but that's okay. You know, but a lot of people, they, they pop up in our conversation. And you know what, they are popular. We know that fans riot for them, the cats scream for them by name, and of course dogs beg for them. These again are the websites that librarians love. But like with any library product, you may or should have some questions. You might look at them and go, are they organic, GMO-free, gluten-free? It's not probably an appropriate question. What do they cost? Much better question. Do they cause cancer in California? I mean, generally, you shouldn't have to worry about this. I mean, I'm in from the, wait a minute, we are in California. Uh, okay. What user info, info do they store? Do they protect the privacy of users? Those are important questions. Bob Dole wants to know if they cause, oh, you know what, enough with this silliness here. None of that. If you are too young to get that bad joke, um, don't ask. But despite their popularity, have you ever asked, are these sites accessible? Do they make, meet WCAG 2.x? That's how I usually refer to it. AA standards. Let's find out. Come on, there you go. So if we consider the nature of the site, DuckDuckGo is a really a general search engine. So if you think about it, it's just, you know, if we're gonna be talking about comparing apples and oranges. Really, DuckDuckGo is a very generic apple. You don't really don't know what type it is. It's not even colored appropriately. Google Scholar is a far more specific search engine. So it's kind of a, more of a defined type of apple, like a Fuji apple. Now LibGuide, so, it's kind of unfair to compare LibGuides to these two because we know that LibGuides is both a, C a content management system and a search engine. In some ways, you can consider it an apple pie. Now, I actually have a point in all this, but if we actually think again about LibGuides, there's something else. There's institu you know, each institution of LibGuides can configure it. So it's more than just actually a, an apple pie. 
you know, institutions can control the images, the content, and that's a major aspect to it, and also the CSS styling. So really, we could actually think about it, it's like the accessibility of a libguide could be totally dependent on what the institution and the content creator does. So they can make it really good or they can make it really bad. In reality, we might want to think of libguides as an apple pie making kit. You have some of the ingredients, the directions, the oven, it's all provided for you. Now, what that kind of means is, though, that you're the ones responsible for it. So if, it, if you decide to add Tabasco sauce to your uh, apple pie, that's your fault for choosing a really, really horrible hot sauce. There are better ones out there. But in all seriousness, though, let's just focus on search result pages. That's what Google Scholar does. That's what DuckDuckGo does. And search results are a part of LibGuides. And also, while talking about doing an accessibility review, I'm going to focus on what aspects are more easily customizable. Because some things, some things are the, just the way it is. And in truth and told, I cannot figure out an easy way to test an out-of-the-box LibGuide. Now, I also just want to make a preemptive uh, apology to SpringShare. I don't know if anyone is from there. This is probably the meanest thing I could do to LibGuides. SpringShare is one of the best companies that I have worked with in regards to accessibility. They have a great team on that. And I promise that I will file a support case on this and help consult with them to make them the most accessible catalog results page ever. For those of you who are in 2017, you heard that talk, because really, it's search result pages on libguides are the Achilles heel of accessibility for them. So what am I going to be testing? I'm not going to do actually talk about a full test here. In fact, actually, I tend not to do full tests. I usually have a quick little set of heuristics I do. The first is, as you all heard yesterday, was keyboard navigation, one of the best things to rule out if a site is accessible or not. Then headings. Headings are incredibly important. And we've had 20 years to get them right, and nobody does. And then image alt text. Normally, that's the case, but these are not sites that really have a lot of images or anything on the search result pages. So I'm actually going to skip that and go to something else. The usability of search results from an accessibility perspective. And I'll explain what this means in a little bit. So remember with keyboard navigation I talked about, some of the key uh, parts of it are it's making sure there's a visible indicator of your focus. And also that the keyboard focus follows a logical, predictable path through the page. There are other aspects, but it's only a 20-minute talk. Deal with it. So let's take a look on how these go. So in terms of visible focus, DuckDuckGo is actually not that good. There's focus in the header. There's that outline dotted box around everything at the top of the page. But once you get into the search results, there's no visible indicator at all. So it's a failure. Google Scholar is very, very good on this. It's very clear where you know the focus is. Kind of. You'll see in a moment. LibGuides, this is something that's definitely configurable. And it's configurable in the CSS. Generally, they have outlines activated for everything. But if your web developer for LibGuides decides to turn off outlines, um, fire them. You know, they're just not being accessible. So it's kind of a provisional pass. But we have to ask the question, are these outlines truly visible? Carly Spina talked yesterday about WCAG 2.1. And one of the changes is this notion of non-text contrast means that even non-text features must meet the color contrast standards. So this means that the outline needs to be of a color that stands out against the background. So we can look at some of these. And, but also, it invites us to start thinking subjectively. Part of accessibility is subjective. You might meet the you know, letter of the law, but is it really what it's meant to happen? So for example, look at these uh, two uh, search boxes. One of them is uh, focused on one engine. And I actually enlarged the size of these for you. You're seeing them you know, magnified. How visible is it? It's the one on the right, by the way. The dotted line is very, very hard to see on that. Then you have to question, what is the color contrast like in these? Um, the one on the left, the Oswestry Disability Index, it's a pretty good color and kind of clear. The one with any time is actually a little hard for me with some red color vision issues. It's a lot fainter. You know, it's kind of too thin. It's only a one pixel dotted uh, outline. 
So it's things to consider there. Now, what about logical focus order? Does it follow what you would expect? Now, one thing you might ask is like, well, if they're not, like DuckDuckGo doesn't have a focus, how can you check that? Well, it's quite easy to do through a little bit of CSS. And what you do is you force the focus onto any element that whenever it appears, you know, you make it big. I like dotted. And of course, it's really important you have to use hot pink. I mean, it just stands out and it's, did you know that's actually a defined web color? But see, that's what it looks like. And the exclamation point important overrides everything else. I'm planning on making this into a bookmarklet. So let's see how they do. Duck, duck, go. When I use it all there, the focus briefly, you can try this out. You'll see that it moves from right to left in the header. It's a little weird, but that's due to how they're using a flex box. But it's pretty good. Google Scholar, however, needs to be seen to be believed. So here we have, and you can see like in the middle of there that we're on this double arrow. That's where the pink uh, outline is. Where do you think we'll go next? Will we go to the Oswestry Disability Index, which kind of seems to be suggestive? Will we go over to the facets? Will we go over any place? Well, this is where you go. You go to that PDF for women's health uh, apta.org. Now, there are several problems with this. One, that PDF is not associated with the physical disability search result. It's actually associated with the Oswestry. Now, visibly, what does that tell you? It's like, no, you know, or, you know, it's like visibly you can tell the distinction. If you are a screen reader user, you cannot make that distinction. Uh, my intern, who's actually spoken up a little bit on Slack, as uh, she's an expert screen reader user, totally had no idea. And thank you, Alan, for confirming my thoughts on that. It, this is extremely, extremely bad. Things are out of order as you expect them. I mean, there is literally no indication there where the PDF belongs, unless you really, really pay attention to links. So Google Scholar absolutely fails, and LibGuides is really good. Now let's move on to headings. So these are the H1, H2, H3 headings. And literally, the standards for these have been around 20 years, come May. That's when WCAG 1.0 was released. And the rules are pretty basic. You should have an H1 tag. That's, there's some debate on that, but generally, you should have one, and ideally only one. Headings should be properly nested, so you, know, you can't have an H3 without a preceding H2. And heading text must also be meaningful. A heading that says heading is not helpful. And why this is all important is that this is useful for screen readers. The document outline is a way for screen readers to jump to relevant parts of the page without having to go through it line by line. So the result, DuckDuckGo, has multiple H1 tags, a lot of them. There is proper nesting, but there is no text that says search results. It's largely just about ads. Kind of disappointing, failure. Google Scholar, well, it has no H1, and the facets on the side don't have a heading, so it's hard to navigate to them. Everything else is good. Proper nesting, heading text, useful. LibGuides, they only have an H1. Basically, it says whatever search term you looked for, say disability, search for disability. Nothing for the facets, nothing to get to the individual results, nothing like that. That will hurt them later. Now, usability search results are these questions of, it's not officially written out in WCAG, but it is something to be aware of, you know, that we can that we can derive from what the standards say. So one thing is we want the search results to have some means of being a fast, a, a fast means for screen reader users to get a, get a quick summary of what the results are. This is generally going to be done by headings or other things. Tabbing, you know, search result pages tend to have a lot of links, so tabbing will probably be pretty extensive. So we don't want there to be too much tabbing. And then we want some cognitive affordances as well. So in terms of screen reader efficiency, what we want is, one, a clear indication of where the search results are so they can jump to it, and then something that enables uh, the screen reader to get a summary. And this is usually either done by making each title for the result a heading or using a table with column headers and all that to allow traversal. DuckDuckGo, as I said, has no heading to indicate where the search results are but a level three heading is used for each search result. 
So I say that's a, pretty much a pass, mostly. Google Scholar, again, is really good. Headings indicate search results area, so it definitely has that. And H3 is used for each result. That actually should be a full pass. So you, I have just found the one typo in my talk. LibGuides, again, only an H1 and no outline structure. And why did I make those green and a plus? So I had multiple errors on this. I apologize. They will be fixed before going to the repository. Keyboard navigation also, uh, you know, keyboard navigation requires tabbing. If you have a lot of links, and particularly if you have a lot of links within the results for things like citation or related works, things like that, that can be tiring because it depends on how many tabs does it take to get you from one search result to the other. Sometimes you can speed this up through skip links or access keys. That's when you do like control alt P or something to go to the next one and all that. But DuckDuckGo, moving between uh, each search result requires two tab presses. There are no skip links or access keys, but two tab presses, that's pretty good. Google Scholar requires, depending on if there's the like file link to the side, um, it takes six to seven tabs. And again, too, you actually have to tab through all the facets on the left before you get there. So this is a lot of tabbing. LibGuides, the movement between each search result requires four tabs. That's not bad. I mean, it's better than six or seven. And again, there are no skip links or access keys. So let's say a pass fail. Now, what are cognitive affordances? Search results should support memory, recall, and filtering. So it means it's a way to, you know, filtering, we all understand that. We understand facets because we live in libraries. Pagination, actually, if you look at the original hypermedia studies, chunking things into pages actually helps memory because that's what memory is based upon, chunking things into groups. And you also want to have an easy chance of restarting, where if your browser crashes or anything, you definitely want to be able to go there. So DuckDuckGo has facets on top. That's good. There are only a few of them. But it uses infinite scroll. So it does indicate pages. But the biggest problem is, let's say your browser crashed, which of course happens, or you had to stop your work and something and all that and go back. If you were having to actually dive into more than the first page of results, you have to keep pressing the load more results button until you get to your later pages. That can definitely be a problem. And I know that's not a usual case. Most people only stick to the first page. But you know, in library settings, we have graduate students. And sometimes you do extensive searches. Google Scholar, the facets are present, and pagination, pass. LibGuides, again, pagination and facets present. So let's look at a summary of this. And you kind of should notice a few things here. One, no site is perfect. Then also, what's really disappointing are the, is the headings. As I said, headings are something we've had 20 years on. Why aren't we doing this well? So how should we interpret these? I know this was just a quick pass and all that. And all the sites did have significant accessibility issues. I will tell you that you shouldn't flat out abandon them. But honestly, the horrendous tabbing in Google Scholar is one of my reasons to say we should never use it. So if you need an excuse, I'm giving you one. It has poor accessibility for screen readers. But accessibility should be a factor in our technology decisions. And we should always be aware of the accessibility in the technologies that we use. That's important so we can better help our disabled patrons and so we can be, so we can also advocate and support our disabled colleagues. Remember, disability does not end at being a patron. We, you know, those of you who work with me have a disabled colleague. And there are a lot more of us than you expect. So really, one thing we talked about a lot today is accessibility and community, that we have to be in it together to really make change. I've made a spot in the Code for Lib community since I started attending in 2015 as an accessibility advocate, and I will continue to do that. But I am not the only one. There are many of us. And we need more and more advocates. And all of you can do your parts as you need. We need your help to make libraries truly accessible. At ALA Midwinter, I was asked to speak about the future of, li future of disability access in libraries. And one of the things I talked about was is that libraries cannot stand alone. 
no single library, no single consortia or, or group can actually really make change, particularly with how much we, we rely on vendors and third-party software. I have talked before about forming an alliance on this. I have laid down the gauntlet at Code for Lib. Lib for Ally will be such an organization. And working with several people, including Jen Dandel at UCSD, Carly Spina, and others, we're going to be pushing for fun this. And you will see info on Slack and mailing lists shortly. You will hold, hold me to this. This is my number one priority. I just want to thank uh, Syracuse University for funding me. All of you have encouraged me over the years, and I have about a minute and a half for questions. And please talk with me. If you don't, I will point out I have had this since 2017 in Philadelphia. This is my Muter Museum leech. Her name is Lulu. Also, just because I have a little time, this is actually has been LIS Mental Health Week. I am normally heavily involved with it because I was here. I did not. And so if nobody's going to ask me a question, I'm going to just pontificate for a moment. Mental health is a serious, serious issue in academia and also in libraries. We do tons of emotional labor, and we need to be there to be supportive. Support can be in having good insurance for mental health, but also just encouraging good work-life balance. If you need a vacation or you need to be able to go to the doctor, that should be supported in your library. And sometimes even if someone is struggling, the best thing you can do is just invite them out for coffee or lunch or anything like that. I mean, take care of, we need to take care of all of us. And for those out there who are listening who have done that for me, thank you, because I would not be here without you. And yeah, I am one of those people who deals with mental health but I'm still here and I'm still fighting. But not everyone has to be as forthright as me. So thank you, no questions? You have, nope, all done. <laughs> okay, Jill Morris and Kristen Wilson. I can't see the cursor, where is the cursor? Oh, escape, duh. PowerPoint, okay. I think. Come on. <laughs> okay. Is that showing? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. So hi everybody, my name is Jill Morris. I am the Executive Director at PALSI, which is the Pennsylvania Academic Library Consortium. And I'm here with my colleague, Kristen Wilson, uh, who is a project coordinator for ReShare and also staff at Index Data, who I'm sure many of you uh, are familiar with. So I'm gonna talk first and then I'll pass it over to Kristen. Uh, today we really wanna just give you an update on a project that has uh, fairly recently formed and so we're not gonna go too deeply into, into code because we're still in sort of our formation process. But we're excited to give you this update. There is a URL on our slide here, projectreshare.org, so you can check out more information there as well. Okay, so um, my job here is to give a little bit of context for what's happening with Project ReShare first. And um, many of you are probably from libraries that do resource sharing of some type or another. So how many of you do interlibrary loan at your library? Yeah, almost everybody. Um, it's a pretty well-known service and something that many of our libraries do. Um, we've had a long history of doing sharing within our libraries and a long history of doing it fairly inefficiently in many cases, unfortunately. Today, we're under a lot of pressures to, um, to do it more effectively. And um, those pressures are probably things that you're familiar with, you know, tightened budgets, certainly increased demand for electronic content. Many of us have reduced shelf space to put our print content on in the first place. There's just less print purchasing that's happened. And as a result, there's just an increased reliance on resource sharing in order to be able to deliver print items to our patrons and the things that they need um, in order to serve the missions of our, of our organizations. 
Um, just to give you some context of the number of requests that are happening, I think this, these numbers are maybe a year or two old now, but about two and a half million requests are happening in ARL libraries per year. Um, and of all of the folks that are involved in this project, we realized quickly that um, we make up approximately two-thirds of those numbers annually. So we've got a, a good group represented here in, in Project ReShare. So many of you are probably familiar with challenges that um, happen in the resource sharing space. I think the one that I want to highlight the most is probably user experience. Um, so more often than not, our users have to jump through uh, lots of hoops to be able to get to the resources that they need. User experience is probably the number one problem from that perspective where um, discovery is an issue. They don't always know what's available to them. You might know what you have locally, but it's very difficult to get a good handle on uh, what else you might be able to borrow from various uh, borrowing networks. Many of our users have to jump through multiple user accounts just to get to the content that they're requesting and then remember which one they requested it from. Um, and we don't do a particularly good job of communication and expectation setting. Uh, you know, when you buy something from Amazon, you know if it's prime, it's going to arrive in approximately two days. Um, and you might make a decision based on that information. We don't always share that kind of data with our, with our users, and more often than not, we don't. Um, sometimes it's because we don't have it, but Sometimes it just seems like the technology just hasn't caught up. Um, many of us are using a variety of ILSs and LSPs that um, don't connect our users with this information. Uh, we also have challenges related to sharing across consortial boundaries. So um, many of you are probably libraries that have membership in consortia like mine or um, other similar ones. And some of you may have memberships in multiple consortia, uh, many of which do uh, resource sharing and have interlibrary loan arrangements or share software. Um, for those of you that have multiple arrangements and different consortial memberships, um, many times you can't uh, just move seamlessly from one consortial borrowing network to the next. You have to literally back out and start the process over again to figure out what your users can gain access to. And it's a different process sometimes for different, uh, different systems. We have challenges related to interoperability. Um, I'm sure many of you know, we, many of you are on diverse uh, systems in your library. People make different choices at their libraries based on their needs um, from various systems and budgets. Uh, and interoperability is so important to be able, being able to connect all of those pieces together for our users. And the last one that I want to focus on is just market consolidation. You all know that there have, there's just been a trend over the last number of years uh, where we've had reduced options because the market has consolidated. So there are actually fewer pro products to choose from if you're looking for vended solutions. So we really just need a more modern approach to resource sharing. And this is where the Code for Lib community, I hope, will come in. And, and we would like to invite you to be a part of this project as well uh, because you guys are all the smart technology people who can help us figure this out. So before we start um, talking in depth about what ReShare is and, and how it works, um, I want to just give you a sense of the vision for, for the project. So uh, this work has really built on the work of thought leaders in resource sharing and consortial uh, resource sharing leaders to think about how we can approach ILL with a user-centered focus. So the vision for this for this uh, software and this project is to create a platform that is truly supportive of user-centered ILL with technology that enables innovation, is scalable, is owned by the community, which we think is so important because more often than not, we don't see our needs being reflected in the software choices that we have out there today. And then lastly is vendor neutral because we need to connect all of our various systems and we don't necessarily all want or need to be on the same interlibrary or rather um, ILS in order to be able to do that. So I'd encourage you to check out the Big Ten Academic Association's uh, vision paper on this if you'd like to get a sense of sort of some of the writing that's happening, happening and um, sort of the thought that went into the vision for this, for this software. So ReShare is, first and foremost, it's a community. Um, it's a community of consortia, libraries, vendors, software developers, service providers, and other related organizations. Um, Mozilla Foundation has been represented as well as the open library environment um, that 
sort of coalesced around this shared vision for how we connect our patrons with information. We've really focused in the beginning on returnable print items, but the uh, intention of this project is to expand well beyond that as well. So this group is a community that's formed, and I think the unique thing, and Kristen's gonna touch on this in a minute, is that um, everybody's coming to the table as equals in this situation. So rather than sort of that typical pay for services kind of model that many libraries um, you know, will put out an RFP and then you'll you'll get back a quote and and a vendor or a developer will pr produce something for you this is all of that brain power in one room together collaboratively working and sharing a vision and working on this and co-owning it um, we are a member of the open library foundation as of December and Open Library Foundation is a 501c3 nonprofit. Many of you are probably familiar with OLF as the home for the Folio project. Uh, just really want to make it clear that ReShare, although it is sort of a sister project, is not uh, directly related to Folio. We're, we're going to benefit, and Kristen will show you how we're benefiting from that collaboration that we have, but it is a separate project. The powerful thing here is that OLF provides us with collaborative infrastructure. So we are able, as consortia, as libraries, as software developers, to come together and have OLF sort of um, maintain the intellectual property for us so that it's not so dependent on one single institution or commercial company. Um, and we've got a sort of a neutral place for it. Um, so the, at a high level, what the ReShare platform will deliver is the ability to do discovery from a patron perspective, to request, to manage requests and route them appropriately um, within the ReShare community, but then also hopefully with, you know, outside of the ReShare community too, so that it can connect to other types of resource sharing systems and networks that you may be a part of. And then to do unmediated fulfillment of those requests. And unmediated is sort of an interesting word. Uh, in my consortium, we use an unmediated ILL software for our consortium right now. Many of our libraries think of the Palsy uh, resource sharing network as an off-site collection for, uh, that they have access to uh, really quickly through our interlibrary loan services. But it's still a very high-touch kind of, uh, kind of uh, endeavor where, you know, there's literally cutting and pasting of book bands that happen that get wrapped around a book um, in order to share items with a patron. And when we were all sitting around and talking about that, there was kind of this realization that, you know, why are we doing, you know, UPS doesn't do that. How do, how do other um, logistics types of companies deal with these types of, of problems? So we're trying to reduce the amount of friction, make it more effective for our organizations at the same time that we're really making uh, resource sharing, hopefully a more seamless experience for our users. Uh, who's involved? So uh, right up here on the screen, we've got a list of the steering committee members. I'm the chair of the steering committee uh, for right now, but we have a number of consortia and uh, different organizations that are represented from consortia and libraries, as well as vendors and developers, and then other related organizations that I mentioned. So this group is the steering committee, and um, I think uh, really a, a, a fantastic group. Uh, they come to these meetings weekly and we and we spec out this project as we spec out this project. You can kind of see on the map view uh, where we're from all over the all over the world and we're hoping to expand this map and have more red dots on it uh, so that we can be sure that we're being inclusive and representing diverse populations. Uh, just real quickly, as part of our timeline, we are aiming to produce an MVP, uh, minimally viable product, for fall of 2019, which is a really tight turnaround, um, and then do software testing and pilots starting in spring of 2020. Uh, all along the way, though, community development and sustainability has been a focus, and the steering committee's job is really to um, provide the resources that we need and, and create the partnerships that we need in order to be uh, successful here. So a question that really commonly comes up is, how are you uh, resourcing this project? So there have been monetary contributions by two uh, consortia policy, uh, who I work for, as well as the Triangle Research Libraries Network. Um, 
each have made monetary contributions to support the development work that's happening in this project. We are also seeking actively uh, grant funding at the moment and uh, other partnerships that would help supplement the activity that we're doing. And then lastly, Index Data has put forward uh, development resources and develop in terms of developer time and also project coordination to, um, to move this project forward. And as we've been doing that, um, obviously one of the questions that gets asked of commercial developers is, well, what's in it for them to actually um, you know, create this code and then open it up to the rest of the world um, to be able to potentially make money off of it in the future? So we've talked a lot as a steering committee, and there's a lot of, I think, fear in libraries. Probably many of you know this. When you tar start talking about open library, or rather um, open source software, um, there's fear, I think, of who's going to maintain it, who's going to provide those services for libraries that don't have the tools um, or for consortia that don't have the development uh, expertise on hand. And so we've put in place um, some provisional service agreements to help incentivize some of our developers to participate uh, on the front end and create some of that software so that on the other side of things, once the software is successfully created, um, they have a revenue stream to, to depend on after the fact. And it, what it really does is it allows all of us to come to the table in a very meaningful way and involve our developers. So up next, uh, Kristen's going to tell you a little bit about how this project is functionally uh, working. Right, so I'm going to talk about um, the model for community ownership that we've been developing for ReShare and try to share some of the outcomes that are coming out of the project already. Um, so I see that there's kind of two sides to the coin of community ownership in in a project like ReShare. And I should say that um, we really are giving or taking a lot from the Folio project as an inspiration. And I see this as kind of an attempt to replicate this community approach and validate it and see if this can become something that really is part of um, the way that libraries can engage in the software development process. So we have kind of a process that's built um, up among several different groups working at different levels of the project from the steering committee at the highest level um, through a product management team that's a little bit more operational setting the scope we have a group of subject matter experts who really know the day-to-day -day workflows inside and out and can give feedback about user experience and then we have our development team which is made up of developers from index data and knowledge integration which is another development firm uh, based in the uk and so this really gives the people who are involved in this project so many ways to take ownership of it and be the ones who are doing the day-to-day -day work and really creating reshare. Um, the other side of that coin is the ownership of the resulting product. And um, Jill covered that really well, so I think I'm going to skip through this because I know we're going to be a little pressed for time. I did want to talk a little bit more about Folio and its role in reshare. Uh, we are going to be using the Folio platform as a starting point for reshare, and so that includes um, a system layer and kind of a middleware layer that um, can be used to build a series of modular applications, and it also includes a UI toolkit called Stripes, which just kind of gives a consistent look and feel and a starting point for a UI. Um, and so I think this is both uh, its awesome for us because it means we don't have to build all of this, but it's also um, community-owned software at work. So seeing the way that a project like Folio can create this and then somebody else can take it and run with it. Um, I probably can't get into this in a huge level of detail, but one of the things that has been a big outcome so far is creating a set of requirements for our minimally viable product, which has the amazing nickname of Inevitable Narwhal. Um, and so you'll see a lot of narwhals around on the ReShare site. Um, but basically, um, you know, kind of the core components that we're looking to build for our first release include a library directory, which is basically just kind of defines like who's participating and what kind of services and rules they need. Discovery, we do have a goal to build a shared index tool that can be used to either integrate with local discovery tools or um, potentially used in some kind of dedicated consortial discovery environment. 
Um, status checking is important. Fulfillment is kind of the nuts and bolts of resource sharing, everything that it takes to get something from point A to point B and back again. Um, but as Jill mentioned, seeing in that area where we can really improve on things like shipping, you know, kind of patron track their book and see where it is and when it's coming. So we're going to try to be asking those questions and then reporting um, is also something we'll be thinking about. Um, one of the things that we're doing that is another thing that has come out of Folio and I feel like has served us really well is taking a UX first approach to the design. And so I like to think of this as starting from the point of what do we want to do and not how do we want to do it. Um, I've been involved in a lot of software development projects for libraries and it's so easy for them to fall into this mode where you just say, well, we're not even going to consider that because we'll never be able to do that. Our developers will never want to do that. Our framework is going to prevent us from doing that. And so what we want to do is say what, what we want to do first. And of course, there will be feasibility analysis that has to be done. You can't do everything, but we can sort of start from that ideal um, and then figure out how to make it real. And so we'll be doing some things like um, user research studies and developing concepts and prototypes and guidelines. And we have an amazing UX designer named Philip Jacobson who creates these like beautiful doodles that he draws on a tablet. And you can um, see the link to the full diagram of this. It's actually really awesome. Uh, we're working on prototyping our shared index, and so at the moment that's just a lot of thinking things through, but we're really lucky to have TRLN in this project, so we're drawing really heavily on their expertise as uh, a group that's already done this. We are also working on our first module for reshare, which is the directory module. Um, and this is just kind of a brief data model. Um, some of the things that it shows are one, that we're really trying to make this um, kind of extensible and thinking about this eventual goal of working across consortia. So we're able to do things like for a library, store multiple symbols, so an OCLC symbol or an IDS project symbol so that um, it's not just locked down to one system. And we're also thinking about things like nesting and creating relationships between libraries and branches. And there's a link here to a demo of this um, that you can see as well that our lead developers done that is actually really interesting. And then this, um, just to wrap up, we have a couple prototype UIs that we're working on. These are using the Folio Stripes toolkit. So these have been really great in terms of just standing up a very basic UI um, that basically at this point just exposes the backend work that's happening with the knowledge that as our UX process moves along, we'll probably do, be doing some pretty heavy revisions to these to make sure that they are working the way that we want them to work. So we have a prototype type for the directory and one for the requests module. And then um, the other thing I would recommend that you take a look at if you're interested in this project is our wiki. Um, in the spirit of a shared community project, we are trying to be really open, uh, posting meeting minutes and notes and documents here. And this is all public. So if you want to uh, dive into this project, uh, it's a good place to get a lot of information. Um, and there's also a link there about emailing if you want more information or to get involved. And so I think we're just about at the end, but thank you guys very much. I don't think we have time for questions unless it could take 12 seconds. So <laughs> thank you, and please do get in touch or email us um, if you would like to talk more about ReShare. Thanks. I know. <laughs> So good afternoon. Um, thank you all for staying uh, a little bit later for uh, the presentation today. I think it's been a wonderful conference. I'm really glad I came this year. 
Um, so my name's Tammy Allgood Wolf. I'm here to talk to you about optimizing library web content for voice. Um, just to give you a little background, the reason I started really looking into uh, optimizing content for voice was a university-wide committee that I was assigned to um, looking into optimizing university web con content for voice. Um, Arizona State University, the very, very large university in the Phoenix metropolitan area, um, we have um, a very innovative staff um, and a program of ASU engineering students um, moving into one specific uh, dorm called the Tooker House. Um, was a new resident hall for engineers on the Tempe campus and um, they could choose if they would like to receive a new Amazon dot, uh, Amazon Echo dot to become part of the first voice enabled residential community on a university campus. Um, so obviously this had some support from the Amazon Alexa team um, and it was designed to enhance students ASU experience by giving them touch free access to information and services tailored to campus living and prepare some of them to become leaders in voice technology development. So what this meant was that we had to really think about optimizing web content on the ASU sites. Um, if you look into a little bit into optimizing web content, you do some Google searches, you'll see a lot of different statistics about voice search. Um, and one of the ones that we came across is that um, voice search makes up for 20% of the total mobile searches. Now this is a statistic back in 2016 that Google um, mentioned. And, um, but it does bring into the idea that, that um, searches are really getting more and more popular for, or, excuse me, voice searches are getting more and more popular. Um, another statistic that I, I want to discuss a little bit that comes up a lot if you search for optimizing for voice search is that by 2020, 50% of the voice of the searches will be voice searches. And this is often attributed to a company called Comscore. Um, but they actually did not originally say it. It was Andrew Eng, um, an interview that he did in 2014. And he was actually talking about both voice and image searching. So when you see t this statistic, just take it with a little bit of a grain of salt. Um, but it is very obvious that more and more users have digital voice assistants and are using them. Um, these statistics are back from 2017 and talk about the, the um, voice assistants being used on smartphones versus tablets versus standalone devices. Um, I think we all know that 2018 was a very big uh, sales year for uh, standalone voice devices. Um, and so these numbers obviously have, have increased dramatically over the last year. In terms of uh, the voice assistants used on a smartphone, uh, Siri still has a greatest, the greatest percentage of those with 44% um, on a smartphone, followed by Google Assistant at 30%, and Amazon Alexa has 17%. And these statistics are from 2018. Um, one of the things that really is relevant to us at a university uh, are the fact that millennials are adopting voice search at a very, very high growth rate. Um, this particular uh, um, uh, chart talks about the, the um, increase in terms of millennial adoption of voice search. And so that's something that the university environment we really, really care about. Um, now voice search is improving as natural language, pro language processing improves. Two years ago, Corey Harper did a really detailed presentation on natural language processing. Um, I'm not going to go into that. That's not my area of expertise. Um, but I do link to his presentation at the end of mine. Um, I think it is safe to say that natural language processing um, has come a very long way, um, but it still has a long way to go. So what can those of us that work in a library world do to prepare for voice searching? Um, I think it was a great presentation when Jason Clark came up here and talked about the activity streams, embedding those. That was really awesome. Um, today I'm going to talk about some of the really base level things that you can do to optimize your content for voice searching. Um, and, and whenever you're optimizing something, it's important to think about the characteristics of, of the voice search itself. So voice searches are longer and contain conversational words. 22% um, are, are queries for local content. So a lot of people just want to know where on the map something is, what the hours are, um, really basic localized content. Um, when we look at our statistics for web users, we see a lot of that activity where people are really wanting to know the hours or the location or things like that from their mobile devices. Um, the format of a voice search is usually Q&A. So uh, they'll ask a question and want to receive an answer. 
Now something to really think about is the answer they receive is that top answer is the only answer they receive and that's very different than a regular search. And it becomes very important when you're trying to make sure that your content is coming up at the top. Um, this is an example of a voice search for how many students are currently enrolled at Arizona State University. Um, the number shown here is very, very erroneous. That's not the right number. If you look down, just three results down on a search, um, you'll see that we ac actually farly uh, surpassed 100,000 students at ASU. Um, but the reason the voice search returns that first result is actually our fault. It's a, um, a, a specific table that's in a well-used web page that doesn't have any structured data attached to it, right? So it's just a basic web page and it provides a little bit of data about enrollment and ASU, by the way, is a, a, a metropolitan camp campus, excuse me, it has several campuses in a large metropolitan area, but Google, the search engine in this case, just picks up that very first number, the 71,946, right? Instead of understanding that the total is really much larger than that. In addition, this is a very old web page. It's written back in 2016, figures from 2016. So it's important that we think about structuring our data so that computers can understand it and also making sure that our content is updated. So some strategies I'm gonna talk about um, in terms of optimizing for voice search are use conversational keywords, create those FAQ pages, optimize your content for rich snippets, claim and update your Google My Business listing, use structured data markup, and then explore other opportunities besides just web page content. Um, FAQs are pretty easy to do. If you have Lib Answers, which is a SpringShare product, it's really easy to get an FAQ um, page up. And then you're able to actually provide um, the uh, specific answers to questions that your patrons might be posing. It's very important in this case to think about what your patrons might be wanting to search for and what they might be asking. At Arizona State University, we have a lot of international students. Um, we need to think about what questions they might be asking. Um, things like personas are very important to understanding what kind of questions might be asked. But then the FAQ actually gives us a very um, easy opportunity to provide specific answers to those questions. Obviously, regular SEO is, is very important as well. Um, things like site maps, you want to optimize your web content as much as possible to make it um, uh, easy, easily found by search engines. And then a little bit about the rich snippets. I've linked to what the Google guidelines are here for rich snippets in case you're interested when I post my presentation. And um, it, it really is thinking about the questions that are going to be answered by these rich snippets. Um, so 40% of those voice search answers are answered by the rich snippets, and we really need to make sure that our content comes up in those. So um, here's some examples of um, things that you can do. Figure out what questions people are asking. Be creative about those questions. Be conversational and obviously answer the question. Another super easy thing to do uh, is just Take ownership of your Google My Business listing. Um, this is a ASU, a excuse me, the ASU Hayden Library Google My Business listing. And uh, we want to make sure that our hours are current. We want to make sure that uh, the address is current, that when we click on to go to the map that that's correct. So these things are very important for making sure that your results show up correctly uh, in mobile searches and in voice searches. Something that um, was touched on a little bit before by Jason Clark is the schema markup and how important that is um, for technical SEO of your site. Obviously, when a search engine is trying to locate something to answer a voice search, um, any type of information that's structured information that you can provide is very, very important. Um, I don't have to tell you guys why structured data is important, but when you work on a university committee, you often have to, to explain to people why structured data is very important. Um, schema.org is something that was, uh, it's supported by all major search engines. It's an attempt to, to define a broad shared vocabulary of concepts. Um, and it's an attempt to make search engines understand what the content is, the relationships between the content, um, and, and the definitions of the content. 
Interestingly, this is a, a new property within schema.org and it's called Speakable. It's currently only used by news articles in Google Assistant, um, but I think it's something to keep an eye on in the future because basically if um, a, a Google Assistant or a search assistant determines that your news result is a good fit, it will read the speakable text that you have defined in your page uh, back to the user. Um, so something to keep in mind that you can write kind of whatever you want under the speakable, speakable property. An easy way to add some structured content if you're not a programmer, if it's not something easily that you can do in JSON, um, Drupal has a, a great um, module called the schema meta tag module, which is an extension of their schema.org module. It is available in both seven and eight Drupal. Um, there, I've linked here some, some WordPress plugins if you use that as a content management system. There are a lot of different ways that you can add structured data to your content uh, without being a programmer. Um, I thought this, this meta tag uh, extension to the schema, dot, excuse me, the schema.org extension to the meta tag in Drupal was exceptionally interesting. We just installed it in our site. But it displays the, the structured data as JSON linked data in the head of your web pages. Um, and here's some more information about that particular uh, module and a screenshot of how easy it is to add structured data to your site. Um, Chris Berg spoke here about, I think it was two years ago at the Code for Lib conference, she was one of the keynotes, um, and she uh, spoke at a, it was a Harvard Leadership Institute a while back, and, and um, I think this is on her blog as well, this quote, um, we'd be wise to start thinking about how machines and algorithms, thinking now about machines and algorithms as a new kind of patron. So I think that's very important that we start thinking about that. Some of you already have and have gone to uh, do quite a bit of research, but others are, are still in that beginning stages, but we need to know that it, that it is certainly coming. Um, there are other opportunities besides just optimizing your regular web page content. Um, some libraries are investigating building Alexa skills. Um, there's also Google Actions and Cortana skills, but Alexa skills are kind of the easiest ones to jump into uh, immediately. If you don't have developers in staff, there are third-party companies that'll do some development for you. Um, I talked to Greg, Greg Davis at the Iowa State University Library. They currently have an Alexa skill. They used a company called Fixstat to build that particular Alexa skill. And what it does is it searches the catalog, but it stops at a point. It lets a user search the catalog by voice. Um, however, the user cannot put a hold on a book, um, check out a book, renew a book. And the reason for that is that the um, patron data would need to be accessed for those features to be enabled in this Alexa skill. So if you're using a third party development company to do things like that, you need to be very, very careful of how they're accessing your data because for us, you know, patron data is very, very private data and we want to protect that. So it's important to think about that and things like this. Um, and privacy, again, I was really excited to see so many different privacy presentations and discussions at today's, or at this week's uh, conference. Privacy is something that is extremely important in my mind. Um, it's not always something we have a lot of control over, especially in these voice assistants, in the voice assistant world. Um, a lot of times we don't have the data, and so someone else does have the data, uh, in this instance, Amazon. So it's important, I think, that we educate our users of what it means to be using the system through a voice activated, through, through a voice device. Um, but if there is any data that we're collecting or we're working with any third party vendors to build any type of application, it's really important that we stop and think about the privacy concerns um, that, that are so important to, um, to all of us that work in libraries. And if you're serving on a university committee, it's exceptionally important to stop the conversation quite a bit and say, what are the privacy concerns here and are we protecting patron data? So I, um, that is the end. I have some resources here. Um, for links to additional pres presentations uh, and readings, and I think I have just a few minutes for questions if anyone wants to ask a question. No? All right. Thank you very much. Sean and Adrian, you're up. And uh, you have the dubious distinction of being the last talk of the conference. And by the way, thank you speakers for being really good about staying on time. It's been great. Where are we? All right.
right, great. So I'm Adrian. This is Sean. We're from University of Georgia. And um, hang tight. You're almost done. Um, so we are going to share about how we've been teaching our collection staff how to write scripts. The collection staff are archivists, librarians, people who work directly with their holdings, people like me. So why on earth would we do such a thing? Well, increasingly, all of our, a lot of our holdings are digital. And so to take care of them, we will find ourselves doing things like cleaning up file names and then moving them to a consistent directory structure. Or you get output from a tool and then you need to transform it to meet our metadata standards. Or you'd run all your files through a set of tools to implement your workflow. And as our holdings have been increasing um, over a petabyte now, we realized that it just wasn't going to scale to do this kind of work manually. And we wanted to learn how to script so we can automate some of it. And having that really clear need um, really helped us stay focused as we were moving through the learning process. So we wanted the collection staff to do it themselves rather than farming it out to our developer for a couple of reasons. Um, I'm sure it will surprise none of you to learn that as basically our one developer, he's very busy with complex projects, um, things that require expertise. But we wanted to do stuff that any beginner could learn how to do. We also have a lot of quick one-off projects that could benefit from a script where you could save an hour or two if you could crank something out, but it would take too much time to go back and forth with someone to explain what you need. For more complex things, it lets us maintain, maintain the scripts on our own as workflows shift a little bit. And don't underestimate how much it empowers your staff to learn a new skill like this. Um, being able to make computers do stuff is awesome if you've never done it before. And it lets us have control over um, key workflows um, that are part of our jobs. So we got started with a peer learning group, a group that was strictly beginners. Um, this had developed organically about six months before we got started um, as library staff started coming together to talk about what tech skills we needed for our jobs. And in May of last year, we decided, all right, we are going to learn how to write scripts. Um, starting with a room that was only beginners um, really helped us out I think, emotionally, right? It gave us a safe, supportive space to mess things up and be confused and kind of get a handle on, on what this was going to be. Um, please don't take this personally, experts. Um, I know a lot of you are really, really approachable, um, but when you're at work and you don't know anything about a thing, just being around someone who knows a lot can be kind of intimidating and make you feel stupid. Um, so first we kind of got at least used to the lingo, used to thinking about what was going on before um, we were around an expert. It also gave us a chance to kind of work through some baggage about what programming is, right? There's sort of a sense that it felt like magic or uh, it felt like you, know, you had to be an expert just sitting typing and everything's coming straight from your brain and perfect code is produced um, immediately, uh, right? This ties into what we heard about yesterday with, you know, exposing, you know, what is it really like? And we learned real quick, it's not magic, it's hard work. Um, but it's a thing you can learn, it's a thing you can Google, um, you can find good examples out there, um, read the documentation, and we weren't gonna have to spend years on this before we could produce something useful. So we decided we wanted to learn Python, because um, it's very common in libraries, so there are a lot of good examples out there to use. Um, and it's supposed to be pretty easy to learn as a beginner, which I would agree with. So we're librarians, we got ourselves a book. Learn Python Through the Hard Way by Zed Shaw. It is an exercise-based kind of way of learning, so it gives you code to play with um, and break. And, and this kind of learn by doing approach uh, really worked for a lot of us. Um, we also met once a month to kind of work through the book together um, while also working on it independently so that we could give each other some support and answer questions. Um, I do wish we had met more often in the beginning. Um, some of our staff could only really block off time to do this if we had a meeting on their calendar. And once a month isn't very often when you're learning a new skill. About four months in, we were ready to start applying the basics we were learning about Python to our work lives. Um, so we got another book, Automate the Boring Stuff, which gets at a lot of the file directory tasks um, that we wanted to be able to do. Um, we also started a GitHub account so that we could share our scripts back and forth with each other. And we started a listserv. Um, there are about 30 people active on the listserv, and 10 or 12 got involved with um, learning Python in some way. 
But the thing that really made the difference for us to be able to go from learning about Python in general to being able to do it at work um, and apply it to our work um, was that Sean, our lead developer, offered to help us out with some workshops. Um, you can definitely learn the language and syntax and all those kind of rules from a book, but learning like the higher stuff, like how do you parse this problem you have into things you can research and go through the process of writing code, that's much better learned from a human who's been there. So um, he did first a workshop on sort of the fundamentals of programming and thinking like a programmer, and then did a set of workshops on using Python to solve some problems that we brought to him. From a participant perspective, some things that made those really effective, um, we were learning the process of solving problems, so we weren't limited to just solving problems that look like what the book had had in examples. Um, we could tackle anything. And since it was based on real world problems, at the end of each workshop, we had a script that solved a problem that we really had, so we could start putting it in practice and seeing how effective this was going to be. And then super, super important, uh, he's very patient with us when we were getting confused and very encouraging when we had little light bulb moments, uh, which helped build our confidence that yes, we can learn this and we can learn it well enough to be able to use it in our, in our work. Um, so now Sean is going to share um, about these workshops from the developer perspective and the hope that some of y'all might be interested in leading them um, for your stuff. So my methodology is the most important thing is syntax is not the core skill of programming. Syntax is easy. You can just read it in a book. You can start, look at Stack Overflow to find out why your typo wasn't working. The key to programming, in my opinion, is learning algorithmic thinking and the ability to discover and apply new information to and those are the core skills. Being able to Google your problem, read Stack Overflow, read the documentation, and move on is what's most important. So all of these workshops were guided experiences in thinking as, as a programmer. I didn't come in to teach them syntax. I had zero desire to teach them syntax. All I did is I took a pro problem that they had, say, we want to transform this XML file from fits into a premise object a premise XML file for ingest into our preservation system. And so for the workshop, I started with, okay, what do you guys think we should do? And as a group, we came up with this, this pseudocode we would need. I didn't tell them what we needed to do. I, I did lead them occasionally when there was a stump, but in general, the group came up with the algorithm together. And then, once we came up with the algorithm, we then went step by step to turn it in Python code. At any point we didn't know, but remember the Python code, we do what programmers do. We looked it up on Google. We read Stack Overflow and then the documentation. And it taught them all the proper skills to, to actually learn to code. And if you're curious, all of my lessons are available now at uh, lessons.lib.ugedu slash Sean. Um, includes all my Python workshops, my fundamentals of pr uh, programming, and I actually even wrote a Drupal module uh, tutorial as well. And they all can be found there. Uh, include, and they include solutions and example files and everything you'll need to actually work through these problems yourself and teach, you know, teach your, uh, your class how to do it. And what's really interesting about my, my teaching is I don't know Python. <laughs> I'm teaching myself Python as I'm teaching them. So it actually is really kind of helpful for me because I'm learning to think and teaching them how I'm learning to think about Python. So, so our participant eva uh, evaluation, we did, a, we did a survey to see how, what, what people were thinking. And we found that the uh, learning Python the hard way book was very, very helpful. Uh, the peer learning was, was pretty helpful, though we had problems with timing, like we mentioned before. We weren't meeting often enough. And then we found that everybody loved the developer workshops. Everyone found them extremely useful. So, but the main problem we have is time. We're weeding only, I'm once a month with the, the lib tech group and I'm giving a workshop every three to four weeks. So we really need to step up our, our time, you know, time invested uh, to get people to an even higher level. But 
we really have done amazing work and like Adrian has written many you know many scripts on her own without having to even ask me for help that have actually solved real world problems for them so our future needs more time and more encouragement our results so far a few can actually write scripts completely by their own Adrian has written several of them a few can update scripts you know we can they come to me they, and they want me to write a simple one-off. I can do it in an hour or so, give it to them, and then they can easily maintain it and fix, you know, find out what they need to do to tweak it for their, um, for their particular needs. Furthermore, now several people aren't afraid to use scripts. Before, people were kind of afraid. It's all magical things, and if something goes wrong, I don't know how to fix it. Well, now that they understand basically how scripts work, they're less afraid. They're per perfectly confident and want, willing to use them. And most importantly, it has deepened the relationships between the librarians and the technical staff. We have a much, much uh, closer relationship. They feel much less intimidated to stop and ask me questions and find out, you know, hey, I'm having a problem here. Can you, can you help me out? So it's been very, very helpful for all of us. So what's next? I'm planning on offering the, my workshops again so that the people who missed them can try them again or people who didn't feel like they got quite enough the first time can come back and get it reinforced. We want to augment the uh, workshop materials for some asynchronous use. You know, we want to make it so that people can try to do it themselves with, and you know, email me questions or whatnot or slack me questions, things like that. Um, we are looking for easier sharing of code. Um, we're a little concerned about our GitHub, GitHub account of putting actual scripts up there for obvious legal and you know, IP reasons, but we're working on those. And we want to add code show and tells, which, you know, where we meet and say, hey, look at what I made and look at how easy it is and what you can and show them what you can do. Questions? Hi there, thank you. I have been interested in doing something like this at my institution and I have encountered some resistance along a few lines. The first are respective supervisors would say to both of you, that's not your job. And the second resistance is if they learn how to blank, we need to pay them more. Or from the staff's perspective, if I learn how to do this to make my life much better, I will be underpaid. and not able to parlay that into a different job. So did you encounter any resistance or any and resentment or anything along those lines? The university librarian shook my hand when I said I wanted to do it. <laughs> the university librarian shook my hand and said that's an incredible thing and incredibly valuable and I really want you to do it. So I had encountered no resistance. Um, Adrian can speak to the, the second part of the question. Um, yeah, so we've been sort of focusing on this, our jobs are evolving, and this is a key thing for us to be able to do as collection staff to actually directly take care of the digital collections. Um, and so I think that's where our focus has been. Um, I have, you know, made sure, you know, if people are hesitating on, are you trying to automate my job or, you know, auto automate my staff, my students out of a job, like we just um, have kind of kept the focus on, like, we have more more work than we have hours and this is a way to kind of take some of the burden off for the boring stuff the routine stuff people are doing so they can spend more time kind of digging deeper providing more context around things um, and so that's kind of alleviated any any concerns around that area a quick follow-up sure. have you had any communication differences now perhaps with your supervisors or your managers about um, if the nature of your work is changing I have found that if my supervisor doesn't exactly know what I'm talking about, I find a communication breakdown as my job changes in this way. I haven't because my supervisor is like deputy university librarian for technology, so he kind of he's got a handle on that. Um, we have sort of adjusted my job description a little bit, and um, we hadn't envisioned writing scripts as being a thing that I would do, um, but that it's proving useful. And so um, we've just made it part of my job. Um, 
honestly, I think the others are just kind of running with it. And uh, no one's been upset yet. <laughs> Anything else? All right, thank All right, you very thank much. You. Great, this is awesome. So I think it's been a great three days, but our fearless leader, Eric Pettiplas, is gonna come up and say a few remarks, so please join me in welcoming him back to the podium. I just wanted to take um, one last moment to thank all of the people involved in this conference, as well as all the people um, who came, yourselves. Uh, you know, it's wonderful to have such a vibrant community, so many people doing such great work. Um, I wanted to thank our sponsors who helped make the conference affordable. So our platinum sponsor is Blacklight and all the Blacklight libraries that contribute. That's super valuable to us. And then also our gold sponsors, Index Data and OCLC. So big round of applause for them, please. Uh, huge thanks to Concentra, uh, Jen and Kathy, who've been out at the registration desk and have just been working tirelessly this whole time. Uh, I have no idea how previous planning committees have done it without them. They've just been marvelous. It would have been really, really difficult. And then um, so many, so many people have volunteered. You've seen them running mics, uh, running the stream, doing all these things uh, for us. So I, I'd like to thank all of the volunteers, but I, oh, I have a limited amount of time. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to read off the, the chairs, but just everybody who volunteered for the conference, thank you very much. Um, so the, the chairs that we have are the website group chair, Caitlin Newson, the budget committee chair, Hank Sway, sponsorship committee co-chair, Jeffrey Sable, keynote committee chair, Andrew Mancuso, pre-conference committee chair, Ben Florin, Program Committee Chair, uh, Kerry Gordon. Kerry also was kind of the de facto stream committee chair. He, he's been over there in, in Video Village uh, the whole time. Scholarship Committee Chair, Elvia Arroyo Ramirez. T-shirt Committee Chair, Emily Wall. On-site Volunteer Committee Chair, Kim Pham. Social Activities Chair, Becky Use. Accessibility Committee Chair, Kate Dybel. Whatever committee chair, Rebecca Holloway. So big round of applause for the chairs and all the other volunteers. Uh, that's all. Please drop your lanyards and name tags and such at the, uh, the registration desk, if you would, so that we can use them next year. And thank you very much for coming. <laughs>